the Rock of Gibraltar. Standing at the entrance of the Mediterranean is a monolith of limestone. At 426 meters, it rises majestically over the straits. In the present day, Gibraltar is a flourishing modern city with a population of 30,000 coming and going, living their daily lives. Unbeknownst to many, a vast and complex group of caves crisscrosses the inside of the rock, formed over millennia by the elements that have battered the mighty stone. With 214 officially recorded sites, Gibraltar has one of the highest concentrations of caves in the world for its size. Full of intrigue, wonder and natural beauty, these natural hollows offer an opening to another way of seeing the rock, an underground Gibraltar. Old St. Michael's Cave is Gibraltar's most visited cave, with one million visitors every year. As an accessible show cave, it gives the public a close-up look at the stunning formations which have been growing inside the rock for millennia. New St. Michael's Cave is just as well known having been discovered during tunnelling when Old St. Michael's Cave was being prepared for use as an emergency hospital during World War II. However, another part of the wider St. Michael's Cave system is unknown to many. Not far from the main chamber of Old St. Michael's hides the small entrance to Leonora's Caves. Today, the Gibraltar Museum Caving Unit leads a multidisciplinary team of Gibraltarian scientists into these caves to explain the research being carried out at Leonora's. Dr. Alex Menes, naturalist and historian from the Gibraltar Scientific Society and honorary fellow of the Gibraltar Museum, tells us more about the discovery and history of these caves. Today we're here in Lenora's Cave, which is one of the caves that uh, is an offshoot from the main chamber in St. Michael's Cave. It was discovered by Frederick Broom, uh, who was the governor of the military prison here in Gibraltar and who has a very interesting history. He was born in Chatham in 1814, moved over to Gibraltar with the 46th Regiment of Foot in 1837, and then made a life for himself here in Gibraltar for many years. In 1846, he was made governor of the military prison, and he had an interest for very, very many years in issues relating to cave exploration and also excavations. Now, he married Leonora Peral in 1841, who was the daughter of a local uh, gentleman here in Gibraltar. And over his uh, period with her, he fathered uh, 11 children, six uh, boys and five girls. That's interesting because we'll learn about what one of his children did in one of these caves. Most of the work he did early on was in the 1860s, beginning in 1862, with the extension of the walls around the military prison and the building of the water tank there. A fissure led to a cave which was very, very rich in deposits, including human artifacts, human bones, and also animal bones. Now, these excavations took place from 1862, 1863, all the way through until the late 1860s. The majority of the material that was excavated from the four Janista caves went to the British Museum in London, where they reside now partly, but mostly, in the Natural History Museum. The, the word Janista was used to name the caves 
almost certainly by Broom himself, although it's not completely certain, is a play on his name, which is, sounds the same as the Broom Shrub, uh, whose Latin name is Janista. But Broom would go on to then excavate and explore other caves. Fig Tree, for example, Bogarroga Cave, St. Martin's Cave, and also St. Michael's Cave. It's whilst he was here in St. Michael's Cave, doing work in the main chamber, which at the time he describes as being filled with earth. He did a systematic survey of, of the area. When he finished the south part of the main cavern, he then moved on to the north part and noticed what appeared to be a small area where he thought there may have been a fissure, and that's how he discovered the, this cave. Now, the cave is called Leonora's, as I already mentioned, and that was named after his wife, Leonora. Now, rather than recount the uh, main parts of, of the story of the, of the discovery of the cave, I'm going to read out some extracts from Broom's own letters that describe his, his explorations and what they, what they entailed. So we have to imagine ourselves now in the, in the 1860s when, for example, the, there wouldn't have been any electric lights, obviously, to come down as we have today, and people would have held lanterns and used ropes, and health and safety issues weren't as, as important, perhaps, as they are today. So, reading from his letters, after he's, as, as I've already explained, after he uh, finished with the main areas on the south side, he came over to the north, and he writes that, after removing nearly seven feet of earth and stones, my attention was drawn to a small hole in a stalagmitic wall, through which could be felt a strong current of air. I had the opening enlarged, and a cluster of stumpy pillars became visible. Several objects, including human and animal remains, were found near this, including a stone axe, the remains of an anklet of shell, and behind, between, and under stalagmites. The party working at the aperture were ordered to follow the current of air. Before I continue, we have to understand that there were officers and also prisoners that um, were under the care of Broom who were involved in these excavations. And we'll see why the issue of the prisoners becomes important later on in this story. And it took two weeks of hard work by all these people to break into a passage that was crammed full with earth almost to the roof. And Broom realized that there was not sufficient room for a man to enter. And so in his letter he writes, one of my young sons crawled in with a lantern to some distance and on his return said that the passage seemed to continue downwards. I had the passage enlarged and one of my warders, a man of spare dimensions, got through. He passed through some passages which terminated in a large cavern. He said the whole thing was so beautiful that it was out of his power to describe it. So, the following day, Broom continued with the excavations with his, with his team. And he wrote that nothing can exceed the beauty of the stalactite formations in the cave and passages. They form clusters of almost every imaginable shape. Statuettes, pillars, capitals, foliage, and figures. The exploration continued. Only a very, very slim prisoner was able to squeeze through what was a very tight fissure. And Broom relates that he was absent for a considerable time and told me on his return such a wonderful story of what he had seen that in order to satisfy myself of the truth, the following day I sent in one of my little boys with the same man. Broom had thought he might have thrown all caution to the wind on this occasion and agonized for the two hours that his son was absent. But then happily out he came, corroborating all the prisoner had stated. Officers and prisoners both worked on the, on the works in excavations and explorations and so on. And Broom was very proud of this. And he acknowledged that during over three hard weeks of labor, he wrote that lying on their backs in water, these people were working with that energy, spirit, and good feeling, which in British soldiers always is exhibited when there is anything extra to be done but it was important that was to be Broom's demise. And he stated that on that very day, during the commencing of breaking through one of the floors in the cave, in the caves we're in today, an order arrived from the war office that there was to be a, a discontinuation of the employment of the military prisoners on the cave exploration. 
And that was one of the issues that was to be a problem for Broome because after that, as a result of him using prison labour, even though, interestingly enough, prison labour was used elsewhere in Gibraltar, he lost his post in, in Gibraltar in the prison here. And then in 1869, Broome was to go back to England. He, he left Gibraltar, went back to England, and died the following year. He died in poverty at a very young age, age of 56, and it is said with very deep depression. It was a very sad end to his life. Uh, George Busk, who was one of the people that received a lot of the material that uh, had been excavated in the Janista Caves, was able to set up a fund for his widow, for Broom's widow and his children, so that they were able at least to subside uh, uh, there be no other income for them. A sad end to the life of such an intrepid and curious man who accomplished so much in furthering our knowledge of Gibraltar's caves. But his legacy would have a lasting and important effect. In 1848, a Neanderthal skull was unearthed at Forbes Quarry on the north side of the rock. And this would have a profound effect on the study of human evolution on a global scale. And to, to finish, I mean, we have to realize that this is just one of the caves, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, Broom was involved in. But he was also involved in other caves, as we've seen. But importantly, he was instrumental in arranging for the Gibraltar skull, also known as Gibraltar I, the Gibraltar cranium, to go to London. That was sent over in 1864. And George Busk and Hugh Falconer were able to study it. Other people also looked at it. And the skull even made its way to Charles Darwin, who saw it and looked at it and commented on it. And he actually said that uh, uh, Falconer brought me the wonderful Gibraltar skull. The uh, Gibraltar skull was instrumental in the way that people were able to reinterpret the Feldhofer Neanderthal skull, which lacked a face. The Gibraltar skull was the first one that had a complete face. And it became very, very important in the debates relating to human evolution at the beginnings of what were the origins of the field of human evolution and anthropology.